On 15th October 2014, Occupy Ghana issued a press statement to mark the first 100 days of the first July Occupy Flag South House event, which led to the formation of Occupy Ghana. The fact is that Occupy Ghana didn't exist until after Occupy Flag South House. So Occupy Flag South House gave birth to Occupy Ghana. And so on the first 100 days, we issued a press statement, and I'd like to read a substantial part of it. We said, Ladies and gentlemen, one strong institution that has been created by our law and literally empowered to nip public sector corruption in the bud is the audit service. Yet, successive auditors general have failed this nation simply because they have been too weak to exercise these powers. Specifically, the Constitution and the Audit Service Act empower the auditor general to disallow expenditures that are contrary to law and then surcharge the public official responsible for incurring or authorizing such expenditure with the amount of any loss incurred to the state. If the official does not pay within 60 days, the Auditor General is to refer the matter to the Attorney General, who is then required by law to commence legal proceedings against the affected official to recover the amount lost to us. Ladies and gentlemen, and still quoting the press statement, to the best of our knowledge and information, this power has not been exercised by any Auditor General. All that successive auditors general seem to do is to issue yearly audit reports and send them to parliament, go to sleep, wake up the next year, and begin this impotent cycle all over again. We were young and quite worthy. <laughs> Today I won't write to this, but let's go on. <laughs> the effect is that public officials who have paid out and spent the taxpayers' money with reckless abandon are comforted in the belief that nothing will ever happen to them. Now, this next statement scares me today. Occupy Ghana will bring this culture of combined impotence and impunity to an end. This was in 2014. We are going to deliver a 30-day notice to the Auditor General and Attorney General, as required by law, that they should stand up and be counted and immediately exercise this power of disallowance and surcharge under the law. It is time for the Auditor General to dig and rake up all past audit reports and apply the law. Notice is further said that if the law is not complied with, we will commence legal proceedings in court to compel the due performance of these statutory functions and duties." Unquote. Impudent, sassy, effrontery, audacity, guilty as charged. But we had no illusions that officialdom would simply roll over and accept this demand. They ignored the statement. On 12 November 2014, we wrote to the Attorney General and Auditor General, putting them on formal notice of our intentions. Our four-page letter set out our understanding of these powers and stated that we have studied the Auditor General's audit reports to Parliament for 11 years, which had identified, quote, a wide range of stolen and or misappropriated funds which are due to the public purse. Nevertheless, and quite without explanation, I think this was Korea's language, quite without explanation, Although the Auditor General is known to have made recommendations, Occupy Ghana and most Ghanaians are not aware of a single instance in which a disallowance or surcharge has been made by the Auditor General, unquote. This time, they took, someone took notice. The then acting Auditor General responded the very next day, acknowledging receipt of the letter. The 13th November 2014 response said two main things. First, it drew our attention to the fact that the Auditor General is independent and said that the Auditor General shall not be subject to the direction or control of any other person. Second, and in the final paragraph, the letter asked us to expect a further response. Quote, as a means of educating Occupy Ghana and the general public about the validity or otherwise of the matters raised in your letter, unquote. This letter, this response from the acting Auditor General led to wide jubilation wild jubilation in certain circles, especially on social media. One deputy minister at the time wrote on Facebook, I just love the final paragraph. We waited for this to fester for a while, and then we sent a response. In our 20th November 2014 letter to the Auditor General, we told him that his reading of the Constitution should not end at Article 187. He should, he should, he should proceed to 2958 where the Constitution says that your independence shall not preclude a court from exercising jurisdiction in relation to any question whether you have performed your functions in accordance with the Constitution. 
So you are independent, but the constitution allows us to go to court to check whether or not you are performing your functions well. What followed was a, a furious exchange of letters between us. The Auditor General's office insisted that they had performed their constitutional functions. We challenged them to give us examples. They gave one. And even that did not follow the procedure in the law and had been dismissed by the court. Then we discovered a bomb on the internet that on 23rd March 2006, the then Auditor General, Mr. Edward Duajiman, I believe he's the chair of the audit service now, at a seminar on macroeconomic modeling and public accounts held at, by SEPA at Mickling, East Ligon, had said in his presentation that the power of surcharge is a unique power given by the Constitution. And then added this, quote, not the date, 2006, Auditor General. The Constitution came into effect 7 January 1993, which gave the Auditor General the power to disallow and surcharge when our monies have been stolen. 2006, 23rd March 2006, Auditor General, quote, so far this power has not been invoked against any public official because they are given opportunity to rectify financial lapses resulting in delayed accountability. This is what killed us. However, because of the escalation in cash irregularities by 99.5% in 2004, involving unpresented payment vouchers and unacquitted payments, the Auditor General will invoke his powers of surcharge against responsible officers for such serious compliance violations in 2006. This robust sanction will hasten and deepen accountability in this country. In other words, between 93 and 2006, we had not used this power. In 2004, there was almost a 100% increase in stealing our money. And he said in 2006, they would implement it. This was a good thing. It got more interesting. We also discovered on the internet a document prepared by the Auditor General containing proposals to the Constitutional Review Commission for the amendment of the Constitution. In that document, the Auditor General says this, quote, the Office of the Auditor General has received adverse comments from development partners who have invested in the national budget and also from Parliament for not actively introducing measures to implement the provisions on surcharge and disallowance, unquote. And so by 2010, we still have not exercised it. So why was the audit service telling us that they had exercised the powers and telling others that they had not? In one letter, we said, our demands are simple. Either you have done your work or you have not done your work, unquote. On 27th March 2015, we had a first direct meeting with the top brass of the audit service in the matter, in the matter at their invitation. This meeting is confirmed by a letter written by the then Deputy Auditor General on 8th April 2015, confirming that we had an agreement to form a working group of five, two from Occupy Ghana, two from Audit Service, one from Attorney General's Department, to discuss the format of notices and disallowance, uh, of disallowance and surcharges, the certificate, quote, come up with a proposed format within two weeks, discuss the manner in which the notices will be issued, and make recommendations for any residual issues, unquote. So we agreed that within two weeks, we will design the notice and they will start exercising it. We were excited. We believed that this matter was, going to end, was not going to end up in court. We naively predicted that, within, that the first disallowances and said judges will be issued within a month. In, but our excitement drove us too far. We pushed our legal team and accountants to look for notices from all over the world. They found one in Uttar Pradesh in India and paid to acquire a copy. They edited it, forwarded it to the Auditor General, and said, we probably need just one meeting. Here is what we were going to des uh, design. That was the last time we heard from the Audit Service. Our several reminders went unacknowledged. Had we run too quickly, and was official don't put off by our speed, were we losing the fight? The public appeared to have lost interest. We had issued court threats and were instead meeting and negotiating with the other side. Tough issues, tough times. Then we discovered what turned out to be our lightning rod. And today I'll make some confessions. Article 18710 tasked the rules of court committee to make rules to regulate appeals against the surcharge. 
So the law assumes that the surcharge will happen. And so said the rules of court committee should make rules to regulate appeals to the high court if you don't like the Auditor General's surcharge. Those rules had not been passed. We saw an opportunity, and here's the confession. If we could get the appeal rules passed, it would conveniently put the cat before the horse, and the tail will start wagging the dog. Literally. If the appeal rules were enacted, then it would be a matter of course that the surcharge will have to happen. You can't have the appeal procedure when the originating cause of the appeal doesn't exist. And so with an evil twinkle in our eye, in our eye and a diabolical spring in our step, we mapped out a strategy which turned out to be the winner. We wrote to the rules of court committee and demanded the rules. They got back to us and said, we haven't done them. Help us draft them. We sent them a draft in less than two weeks. This time we took a little bit of time. We didn't take days. We waited for about two weeks. We didn't want to scare them as well. We were on the same page. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2016, the committee sent us their work. We commented on it, presented to parliament the bill, and it was passed as the civil, High Court Civil Procedure Amendment Number 2 Rules 2016 CI102 that entered into force on 5th January 2017. If you ever come across those rules, please call them Occupy Ghana rules. Individual citizens in this country, for no fee, drafted those rules, gave it to the authorities, parliament passed it. It's, you can do it. We can do it. We, so our scenario was created. The cat was before the horse. The tail was beginning to wag the dog. But the actual disallowance and surcharge had not happened. Once we knew that the bill was going to parliament, we sued. We sued the, the, the attorney general as the case where it would be. We had lawyer Thadio Sori, who worked for next to nothing. We filed the case on 21st June 2016. In all, we filed close to a 300-page brief. My Lord had to read 300 pages of our arguments. But our entire case rested on two simple arguments. First, we conceded that the Constitution vested the power to disallow and surcharge in the Auditor General with the word may. He may do it. But we argued, quote, whether the word may is merely permissive or it should be shall as mandatory, the abject failure of the Auditor General to ever exercise the constitutional power, not even once, in the face of successive financial infractions that he discovers yearly, is a breach of the Constitution. Unquote. That was the argument. That the Constitution gives you power to do this if you see ABC. Every year you see ABC and you don't exercise the power, you are in breach of the Constitution. Our second point was that in Article 295, the Constitution says if a power is vested in you, you shall exercise it from time to time as occasion requires. So we said, where circumstances have arisen that would trigger the exercise of the power or the occasion requiring the exercise of the power has arisen. And a person has arisen, a person vested with such power has no option but to exercise it. Therefore, as long as the circumstances to trigger the exercise of the power have arisen, the Auditor General has been under a constitutional obligation to apply the power and help recover the monies lost to Ghana from the people responsible for the loss. Sit, now, this, this was, our, I, I believe, our punch. Sitting idly by and never deploying the power of disallowance and surcharge cannot be a reasonable use of powers. Indeed, we will humbly submit that the lack of use of the power is an abuse of the power. Unquote. These were arguments of the Supreme Court. The government responded strongly, throwing the kitchen sink at us. They insisted that we were wrong. The Auditor General has been exercising that power through management letters. They even argued that we, the court didn't have jurisdiction to hear the matter. In the interim, the outgoing NDC government appointed one Daniel Domelo as Auditor General. <laughs> that was a game changer. He met with us. And we even explored an out-of-court settlement, but decided to wait to see what the Supreme Court would do. 
That change in leadership in, at the other service brought with it a refreshing change in attitude and approach. Thus, by the time the judgment was delivered, Occupy Ghana, the Attorney General, the Auditor General, hitherto adversaries, had become strong allies in the same cause, joined at the hip, singing from the same hymn sheet and fighting from the same corner. Effectively, the Auditor General went to court for the judgment, saying, my laws, please give the judgment against me. <laughs> On 14th June, this day, a week before the first anniversary of the date we filed the action, the Supreme Court spoke. It was a unanimous judgment. Panel of seven judges. Presided over, and history is very important, interesting. Presided over by Sophia Ekufu JSC then, just five days before she was sworn in as Chief Justice. The judgment was read by Doche JSC, who is chairing this function. And it was clear that our CI-102 strategy had worked. Justice Doche said, the enactment of, quote, the enactment of CI-102, now, who did CI-102? Occupy Ghana. And Parliament passed it. So Justice Justice says, the enactment of CI-102 makes it quite certain the powers of the Auditor General are to retrieve from persons who have caused loss of public funds in their management of the economy, in their management of savings, which is contrary to law. The law speaks for itself, and there can be no turning back on this. The law who drafted it, Occupy Ghana, speaks for itself, and there can be no turning on this. The tail was wagging the dog. The court then considered the critical issue of may and shall, and this is what it said. It, this is what it asked. Should this court hold that because of the word may, the Auditor General's powers of surcharge and disallowance are not mandatory and can be exercised at the whims and caprices of the Auditor General? Are these constitutional obligations discretionary then? Unquote. The court then answered these questions in a way that blew our minds. It referred to Mr. Duyajiman's presentation and the promise to implement in 2006 and held this, quote, however, this resolve to exercise this power from 2006 has not only been breached, but there has been stoic silence from the Office of the Auditor General to date. When we put all the learning together, the may in Article 187 becomes a mandatory may and no longer permissive. This is to afford us the opportunity to enforce the provisions of Article 187, which would deepen probity and accountability. The Supreme Court went on. It is to be noted that the times we are in as a nation require that we deepen and institutionalize principles which will uphold proper and decent management and protection of public accounts. I have this in bold. The tendency where public accounts are considered a fattened cow. This is the Supreme Court speaking. So now, the originator of uh, create, lose, and share. Now speaks about fattened cow. He's sitting there. <laughs> the tendency where public accounts are considered as a fattened cow to be milled by all and sundry must stop. Our laws on financial management must therefore be made to work to prevent absurdity in our enforcement regimes of same. We reckon that it is in pursuance of these noble objectives that the Rules of Court Committee enacted CI 102. Continue. The rationale for the above. C-102, is to give teeth to the constitutional and statutory mandate of the Auditor General's powers on disallowance and surcharge to bite. The court then made the following consequential orders. Quote, henceforth, the Auditor General shall take steps to recover. The Constitution said may. The court said we read that may, may as mandatory. Henceforth, the Auditor General shall take steps to recover. The Supreme Court wasn't done. Significantly, it held, quote, finally, the Auditor General is here, the Attorney General is hereby ordered to take all necessary steps to enforce the decisions or steps taken by the Auditor General to ensure compliance, including criminal prosecutions. So the Supreme Court dealt with the Auditor General and went to the Attorney General and said that if the Auditor General disallows, pursue it and prosecute people. We didn't ask for that. This was additional blessings from the Supreme Court. And so right there in the judgment we celebrate today, we have two post-surcharge safeguards, and we are speaking about safeguards. First, resource law enforcement agencies. This is what the court said. 
What is apparent, quote, what is apparent is that there's an urgent need to adequately resource not only the office of the Auditor General, but also that of other constitutional bodies like the Judiciary, Shraj, and Attorney General, to mention but a few. If we had had the OSP at the time, I am sure the Supreme Court would have mentioned it too. Who are the front runners in our fight against corruption? This will ensure that the impact of these constitutional bodies in our quest to ensure property and accountability is put on a higher pedestal. They added, we believe that as a nation we have reached a critical stage in our governance systems where we must not shy away from spending wisely in order to superintend the public purse. This is the only sure way to ensure that good governance principles are not lost. There's an old adage which says, penny wise, pound foolish. We must therefore adequately fund these constitutional bodies, including the Auditor General, to ensure maximum protection of the public funds, unquote. The battle to ensure surcharge had been won two years to today. The, but the battle to safeguard has just begun. The Auditor General is mandatorily required to disallow and surcharge whenever he discovers that wrongs have occurred. The language of the court is so imperative that I dare say that the Auditor General has no discretion in the matter. If he fails, refuses, or neglects to disallow and surcharge, he could be in contempt of court. Mr. Domelovo, we salute you for the work you are doing, but Occupy Ghana will gladly cite you for contempt if you ever do not disallow or surcharge when the situation so demands. Sir, this is not a threat, it's a promise. <laughs> but to the, words, the, the, the Supreme Court's words of wisdom, they added a second safeguard, enforce the law. The court said that civil recoveries must go hand in hand with criminal sanctions. Now, the law already assumes that this is happening. If you look at Section 85.2 of the Public Financial Management Act, it says this. Please listen. Quote, the Attorney General shall on annual basis submit a report on the status of any action commenced on behalf of the government to the Finance Minister, Auditor General, and Parliament following the findings of the Auditor General and recommendations of the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, unquote. So every year, Ghana's Attorney General is supposed to report to us who they've recovered monies from and who they are trying following the Auditor General's work. Occupy Ghana confesses that we have not followed this up. We assure Ghanaians that the first thing that will leave our desks on Monday morning is a polite letter to the Attorney General asking for an update. Maybe another fight is brewing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ghana has no shortage of laws that will punish the stealing of our funds. We just don't enforce them. Often, we forget the laws exist. The Auditor General, as we have heard, discovered that when the government asked public officials to submit claims by contractors for the government to pay, they submitted claims to the tune of 11.8 billion CDs. Public officials told the government that this is how much you owe contractors. Government gave it to the Auditor General. He audited and found out that 5.4 billion of the 11 billion was foam, fluff, padding, juju and tricks. <laughs> now, this is serious. So the Auditor General promptly disallowed it, exercising his powers under Article 187, and as the Supreme Court binds him to do. But who would have spent that money? Think about it, if government had made it available. Which officials submitted the false accounting claims? Was there a conspiracy and or attempt to defraud government to the tune of a billion US dollars at today's exchange rate? Has anyone answered any questions to the CID, Yoko, or OSP, as the case may be? The Auditor General has issued disallowance and search certificates as we speak to the tune of half a billion cities. And I'm sure it's more by today when he comes to speak. He has recovered 67 million cities from people who had basically taken our monies and gone home with it and counting through surcharges. We have law that says that corruption of public officers is a crime. And although it's a misdemeanor, you can go to jail for up to 25 years. In fact, private acts of corruption, I only recently found out, are also criminalized. And 
if you take a bribe to compromise your employer or principal's affairs, you could also go to jail for up to 25 years. Under the Government Contract Protection Act, this was passed by AFRC in 1979, any official who issues a payment certificate for government contract where the money is not due, that the work has not been performed or the service not provided, is liable with the recipient not only to refund the money's due, but to refund it up to three times. So the one who issues a, pay a certificate which pays a contractor 10 million when the contractor deserves two, both that person and the contractor must refund 8 million times three to the government. If there's corruption, and then could go to jail for up to 10 years. This is in the law, passed by revolution in 1979. If there's corruption in it, the jail term could go up to 15 years. I'm not aware that this law has ever been applied after it was enacted in 1979. We must ask why. Under the Protection of Public Property Act, if you publicly dissipate, if you intentionally dissipate public funds, you could get 10 years in jail without the option of a fine. Listen to the following. Intentional misapplication of causing loss or damage to public property, loss caused by carelessness, gross negligence, or dishonesty, failure to account for public property entrusted to or under your control, using public profit, property for private gain, Obtaining public property by false statements could attract, attract five years in jail. It is in our law. I love this one. There's an additional penalty that if you have used government monies in any of these ways, the court could compel you to transfer your assets in Ghana to Ghana. Indeed, your assets outside Ghana, the law says that the court will compel you that that's your house in Dubai. You couldn't have acquired it unless you had misused our funds. Ghana hereby owns it. It is in our law. This was passed by the SMCD, soldier government. <laughs> Time will not permit me to present a compendium of laws that exist and may be used to safeguard the public purse. But for now, several of them remain as beautifully ignored adornments in our statute books. This needs to change. To safeguard, protect, defend, to safeguard is to protect, preserve, and maintain. We need to move from the mode where Ghana is just one large compound house, where everyone knows everyone, someone knows someone who knows someone, where friendships, family relations, tribal links, religious affiliations, old school associations, and partisan connections trump the law and principles. If we want to safeguard and superintend the public affairs, Occupy Ghana says it agrees with the Supreme Court. First, provide the resources to the relevant agencies to work. Second, enforce the law. Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. He's also widely credited to have said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We need to change. This nation needs to be graced by the wise, brave, and strong who are prepared to help the right and fight the wrong and to make our folk a nation. When Occupy Ghana looks back to when we started this fight to help the right and fight the wrong, to today, when so much is happening with what started as a simple statement, Ghana has made some progress. We were derided by some and encouraged by others. For example, right after a minister had publicly savaged us. We got support from what many would consider an unlikely source, Mr. John Snesir Dunketia. He jumped to our defense. He's reported to have said on 16 January 2015 that it was retrogressive for anyone to brand Occupy Ghana as anti-government at the time, when all it was doing was seeking to complement government efforts at fighting corruption. He added that he couldn't fathom why the Auditor General had all of these powers but had failed to crack their whip. He said, quote, I believe Occupy Ghana is helping the government's fight against corruption, unquote. On 8 January 2018, Occupy Ghana found, it, found its way into President Ekufado's 2018 State of the Nation address when he said, quote, 
the role of Occupy Ghana in increasing awareness of the importance of the work of the Auditor General should be recognized, unquote. On 20th January 2014, when we were launching this fight, the speech that I read recited, that I recited the fully, these words of Osibisa. It will be hard, we know, and the road will be muddy and rough, but we will get there. Ladies and gentlemen, we got there. We got there. It was hard, it was muddy, it was rough, but we got there. We had to present something to Auditor General once. So on Christmas Day, I was in the office working, and my son said, Daddy, it's Christmas Day. So I went home to eat groundnut soup. This event is organized by hitherto adversaries in court. The Attorney General, the state, the Vice President is here. The Auditor General is here. Occupy Ghana, he's here. If the OSP had been there, he would have been the impartial arbiter. And then the judiciary are here. Ghana got us here. Truly, what lies ahead is more than what lies behind, but we soldier on. It is said that real supermen and women do not leap over buildings in one single bound. They take small, determined steps consistently over time. And so step by step, bit by bit, little by little, few, few, kakra, kakra, poko, poko, we will get there. The final words in the book called Ghana Incorporated should read, and in the end, Ghana won. And in the end, Ghana won. Ghana has to sing the song of DJ Khaled, who says, all I do is win, 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 no matter what. Got the future on my mind, I can never get enough. Every time I step up in the building, everybody's hands go up and they stay there because Ghana has to win. Resource the agencies, enforce the law, then Ghana will win. Thank you.